Morehouse College. Um, yeah. as, the, as the president of the NBA uh, Player Association, how important was it to incorporate the HBCU into this game? Um, man, uh, I mean, that's a, that's, that's a long story as far as how we got to, to having an all-star game or whatnot. But, um, you know, when we went to the bubble, it was something that a lot of players talked about as far as supporting HBCUs, you know, how could we champion them? Obviously, um, I had done, uh, some work myself personally, but we talked about it as a collective, right. In the bubble. And then, um, the league brought the idea to us to, to support HBCUs if we were going to have the game here in Atlanta. And uh, we said that we would support it. All right, thank you. No problem. All right, next up we have Simone Sandry followed by Eric Walden. Yes, um, yesterday Adam spoke about the vaccination program and I, obviously your, your voice carry a lot of weight on the player association and in the NBA in general. Do you plan to vaccinate as soon as, uh, as it is available for you guys? And would you advise a member of the player association to vaccinate as soon as uh, is, the vaccine is available? Yeah, I think all of these different type situations are personal decisions, right? You know, we're a players association, we're a union, but there are things that are personal to every player. So, uh, you know, we'll keep talking about it as, as a union, as players or whatnot, but um, I don't see any mandate coming in forcing someone to, to do something, so. All right, next up we have Eric Walden followed by Dwayne Rankin. Gil, what up? Hey Chris, this is uh, Eric Walden from the Salt Lake Tribune. Uh, obviously Mike Conley became kind of a last minute addition to the game. He became the guy who became a first time All-Star uh, as, as the deepest into his career in his 14th season. Just wondering if, uh, you could share, you know, what, how you've gotten to know Mike over the years and, and what it means for a guy like that to finally, you know, get into this game after all these years of, of coming so close. Man, I, I'm so happy for Mike. Um, Mike wins like the, the nice guy award every year in the league. Um, he just hoops. Uh, and hell, Mike might be a better golfer than he is a, a, a basketball player, but, uh, you know, not to date myself, but I actually hosted Mike um, on a visit when I was in college. I was about to leave Wake to go to the NBA. And Mike was in high school and I, I hosted him and Greg Oden, right? So I, I didn't know Mike for a long time now, him, his dad, uh, his family, and, you know, he just stays the course, you know what I mean? And I'm happy for him. And this is something that's well-deserved, but certain guys in this league and over the course of their career, they don't need you know, things like this for validation or for us players to know um, how good uh, of a player that he is. All right, next up we have Dwayne Rankin followed by Nicole Jarena. Thanks, thanks, Chris. Good to see you there, that you got there good and, uh, good and safe. Just wanted just to ask just a couple of things. One, just about Devin, obviously not there because of the knee. Just how is he feeling? I'm sure you, you two guys have talked. And then two, how much of this is just, just does he know he's not there? This is part of just showing how far Phoenix has come by having two All-Stars this year. Yeah, man. Uh, I actually just got done talking to Book before I got on here. <laughs> it's, it's actually tough being here without him. I was telling my brother on the flight yesterday, um, First time, or the last time, me and a teammate, I think, it was me and Blake. I don't know if it was 16, one of those years or whatnot. So I was actually looking forward to come here, come here with Book. Uh, but his health is most important. Um, you know, it's an unfortunate situation, but the timing, you know, going right into this, this little break, um, I know him and how much he hates to miss any game. So I know he's, you know, rehabbing and trying to trying to get ready. Like I said, just a quick follow, just with you and him both being all-stars, what does that say just about the Suns and, and this resurgence and having two guys and the record you guys have? I mean, all this is is, is sort of a, I know there's a second half of the season, but just speaking on that part of the first half and you two being all star what that means to this organization? Uh, I think it's great for the organization. It's great. Um, I mean, we expect it. You know, we don't never really talk about our expectations, but we sort of expected our team to be here. 
Um, and we just, we got a long way to go. Uh, I've been playing against Phoenix for the last 15 years. <laughs> you know, so I remember the Steve Nash's, the Sean Marion, Amari Stoudemire, all them teams. Um, so, you know, it's crazy for me to think that they hadn't been in the playoffs in that long because I remember when they were super duper nice. So it don't seem like it's been that long, but nice to, I guess, be here. All right, next up, we have Nicole Drina followed by Dan Wojcicki. Hi, Chris. How, uh, hi. How do you feel to play aside LeBron James and um, very team, a very play, a very challenging backcourt with players like Stephen Curry, Don Sheet, and Damian Lillard tonight? Um, fortunately, some of them guys you didn't mention I've known for a long time, <laughs> so we didn't play uh, pick up, uh, USA, all this different type stuff, but it's something that never gets old. And that's why, um, a few years ago when we decided to switch the all-star game over like this, I think this is what makes it that much more interesting. You know, it's funny, um, all those years, you know, I was in the West bronze in the East, we play against each other in the all-star game. And it's crazy to think last year was our first time on the same team and this year too. So, um, it's cool to mix it up to where, you know, you don't, you can play with different guys in different conferences. All right, next up we have Dan Wojcicki followed by Cristo Saltis. Chris, what's up, man? Um, what's happening, Dan? Uh, I, gu I guess my question for you is over the course of your career in this league, the sort of the value placed on practice has changed. <laughs> um, and what constitutes a practice has changed. Um, can you just kind of describe that? And then also, do you think that's hurt players at all the way practice is kind of, I don't know, kind of gone to the wayside? That's a deep question, Dan. I'm not a coach. I got my own personal opinions about all that different type of stuff. But um, it it has, it has changed. It honestly has changed. Um, and, you know, I'm not a doctor or anything like that. So some of it is rest, you know, sleep, recovery and all this stuff. So um, depending on what type of team you have, you know, there is huge value in practice, right? Because that's how you learn. That's how you're taught as um, where you sort of get some of that, that grit and that grind. Um, but you do have to balance it. You know, you have to balance it with the amount of games and the time and stuff. So I don't know. <laughs> all right, next up we have Chris Osaltis followed by Alex Gaze. Hello, Chris. I hope you are doing well. I would like to ask you, it's your 11th uh, appearance in the, in the All-Star game. How special is this uh, appearance for you? And what are the reasons that they made so that made special this appearance, this season? Um, uh, it, it's always special because it's something that you can't ever take for granted, especially when you've been in the All-Star game in different ways, right? There was a point like back around 08, 09, 2009, 2010, where I just sort of knew that I was going to be in the All-Star game because I was going to be voted in by fans, you know? Like, there's certain guys in our league who just know they're going to be there because the fans are going to pick them, you know? But when you you have to get voted in by the co coaches, it's always a different feeling, right? So you you definitely appreciative for that. Um, and, like, for me, like, my kids are getting a little older. Like my son's 11 now, so he pays attention. He, he's here with me. And um, I don't know, you just never know how many more of these are, are, are going to occur. So grateful. All right, next up we have Alex Glaze followed by Greg Moore. Hey, Chris. Uh, obviously, yes. you know, you've played in all star games uh, before. Just curious, what is the feeling this year, obviously it's different, um, but what, what's missing from, from this year's all-star experience that you've had in years past? <laughs> what's missing? Yeah, like from just the weekend, you know, that just, it, it's, it, it, this year is very different. Just being here in Atlanta, kind of just for today, just kind of what is, what's missing from the weekend for you personally? I mean, it's a whole usually. pandemic outside. You know, one of the biggest things missing is a whole lot of my family. You know, they usually come, you know, but we, we made this a fellas trip. Got my brother, my nephew, my son, and my dad drove up from North Carolina, 
right? So um, it's, it's different in a lot of ways, um, but I'm interested to see what it's like when you get to the game. You know, usually there's a practice, there's events, the Jordan party, all these different type things. Um, so I'm interested to see what it's like when you get to the game because, uh, you know, for us, everything can be different, uh, this and that. But once you throw the ball up, that's what's all the same. And just uh, on a different note, yesterday, uh, Adam Silver said pretty much yesterday that uh, when it comes to vaccines, players are going to make their own decisions. Just your personal thoughts on that and just if that's the right way to moving forward, kind of getting things back to, to normal with the league. Yeah, um, somebody asked me that, asked me a question, maybe it been the first question. And I was saying there, there are certain things um, that are personal. Right. So I don't see any mandate coming down telling a player, you know, you must do this. You have to do that. So. All right. Next up, we have Greg Moore, followed by Jaisha Smalls. Who is it? Oh, gotcha, Greg. You guys got me yet? There we go. Yeah, there we go. You. All right, man. Great. Hey, listen, good to see you. Congratulations, of course. Um, no doubt, dude. When you mentioned your son being there, um, so first of all, it got me to thinking about your State Farm commercials. It got me thinking about my sons. But now I'm thinking about myself as an 11-year-old. I'm thinking about my earliest All-Star memories. Mm. Now I'm curious about yours. Did you watch the All-Star game growing up? Were you a huge NBA fan? What are your earliest All-Star memories? I was a huge uh, NBA fan. Um, man, that's a, that's a really good question. Uh, Y'all probably don't remember. Um, it was his, uh, it was a VHS that was called um, Michael Jordan's Playground. Yeah. Right? So Michael Jordan's playground was this thing about MJ and it starts off where MJ like this ball rolls out and he stops it with his foot. And, you know, he was dancing with kid and play in them at the end of it. And me and my brother used to watch it every day when we got home from school. And it talks about the dunk contest, shows you the dunk contest because we didn't have YouTube and all that, obviously. Right. But, um, yeah, I, I remember all that. I remember when uh, Magic played in the all-star game. I remember when he hit that three on the wing. I remember all these different types of things. So yeah, my son definitely has a totally different childhood than I had. <laughs> just, a, just a little different. All right, let me leave, let me give you one more, man. Um, you know, when, when you stop and reflect on, you know, that legacy, the, the moments that you're remembering and all, what does it mean to you to be such an indelible part of that? Um, I don't know, I think I'd be a, a little too busy right now to let it soak in and take it all in and tell you the truth. You just yeah. always on the move. And, you know, for me, um, even yesterday going, I had calls and meetings, all this before we went to the airport and we were headed to the airport. And uh, I asked my brother, I said, we got to stop by Target. And we stopped by Target <laughs> so I could get a, po so I get a Polaroid camera. I just wanted a camera because that's the only way you can remember some of these things, right? Because a lot yeah. of times memories is all we have. And my man, Jim Ice, who not with us every step of the way as we walk through, you know, usually when we come to All-Star, you can have somebody with you taking pictures or getting videos, capturing those memories. But this year we got to do it ourselves, right? So um, it's just perspective. All right, next up we have Jaisha Smalls followed by Mac Wiederman. All right, what's going on, Chris? Um, I'm a student journalist from Bennett College. So my question will be more based about your new journey into WSSU. So do you think you'll be um, you know, on campus, depending on how COVID-19 um, takes place, do you think you'll be an on-campus student and taking in-person classes? Man, that's a great question. Uh, I, I, I would like to. The last time I was on campus was 2009 when I was taking classes at Wake. Uh, right before my son was born. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I'm working right now, so I know I can't go. I can't go to class right now. But um, if possible, I would love to love to actually go on campus for a few classes. 
I will okay. walk across that stage at some point, though. I promise you that. Absolutely. So what, what would your degree be in? Uh, communications. Okay. Communication. Cool. Thank you. No problem. Is somebody uh, talking? Oh. Yeah, Mac Lederman, you're up, you're up next. Hey, Chris, hope all is well. Uh, my name is Mac and I'm a student journalist with Northwestern in Chicago. Um, yep. I've, I've recently been working on a story about a women's bowling team at Lincoln University, which as you may know, is a small HBCU in Missouri. And uh, this group of women, of young women, they have like a really amazing and resilient story, but unfortunately their team was discontinued this past year due to the financial stress of uh, COVID-19. So I know bowling is one of your passions and you know, you've also been outspoken about the need to support and raise awareness at HBCUs. So my question is, why do you think it is important to support sports of all kinds, even small sports at HBCUs? And how do you think bowling in particular can help create opportunities for young people? Man, that's, that's, that's a great question. And it's dope that you're doing that. And um, uh, shout out to Mike Wilbon, who went to Northwestern too, and uh, Lincoln. Um, and as far as bowling goes, um, you know, it's, it's crazy. Um, there's so many different sports out there, right? Whatever it may be, basketball, soccer. I, and then when people hear about bowling a lot of times, they'd be like, what? That's a sport? I'd be like, it absolutely is. And for me, I grew up in bowling alleys with my dad. My dad was in all types of bowling leagues. And so that's why I love bowling. And I'm glad you mentioned that because that's something I think that happens at HBCUs more often than not is that uh, sports get cut or People don't know stories where I remember uh, it was a school that the basketball team had to be the cross country team, right? Just because they had to make sure that they had enough sports or whatnot to get the funding. So, um, man, that is unbelievably horrible to hear. So does the bowling program is wiped out at Lincoln? Sorry, Matt. Oh, sorry. I was just waiting for them to unmute. Yeah. I mean, this team has like a really awesome story. You know, they were like a predominantly black team playing in white tournaments. And um, there was kind of like a series of unfortunate events where a tornado like knocked out their bowling alley and then like an absentee coach like failed to give kids new scholarships. So then COVID pandemic, nine, pandemic 19 happened. So, you know, it's really unfortunate that the team can't play currently, but I guess the hope is once everything is kind of stabilized and the finances are in place that, you know, they can bring bowling back. Man, Cole, can you find out that story for me? Can you get a chance? For sure. All right. Appreciate that, man. All right. Next, we got time. Got to wrap up here. But we'll, got to do, we'll do two more. We'll do uh, Augusta and a boy, followed by Alvaro Martin. Augustine, are you able to unmute yourself? Hi, you hear me, Chris? Yep, yeah. now we got you. Yeah, yeah, no. Well, hi, Chris. Uh, you had the you got the chance last year to be a part of the Elam ending on Chicago game, uh, the the first experiment for the NBA with, with this kind of final for the game. It was fantastic from outside. Uh, I wanted to know your feelings being a player uh, involved in in this type of situation without a clock and playing with with the score and what you what are you waiting for tonight's game? Oh man, um, John Muger and the guys at TVT, right? Um, great partners, friend, friends of mine, and um, just having an opportunity to coach in the TVT, being a fan of the TVT. Uh, I remember I reached out to Adam and was like, hey man, this TVT and it's kind of cool. It may be something cool to introduce into the All-Star game. And so uh, obviously everyone was a little skeptical last year watching the game, not sure, you know, how it was going to go. I wasn't sure, you know, it was just something to, to try to make the game a little bit more exciting. So last year it was a lot of fun to see the, uh, the competition and to, to end the game with the made shot, right? So the, you don't just dribble the clock out. Somebody has to make a free throw. Somebody has to make a shot or something like that to win the game. And so, uh, 
you know, it worked, it worked last year. We'll see what happens this year, but uh, always dope to uh, introduce new things to the game. All right, and our final question will be Alvaro Martin. Good morning, Chris. Congratulations on the All-Star. When everything's said and done, you'll be known for being a winner and impacting your new teams in terms of their winning percentage. Uh, that is a process, of course. And we saw you, as soon as you signed up, go to Phoenix and begin to practice and work. That is a learning curve. So by now, I'm sure the team has learned a lot from you. You've learned about, a lot about the team. How much is there to do in the second half of the season in terms of being prepared, not necessarily to achieve, to win a championship, that may be out of your hands, but to compete and to be a smart team and be a prepared, aware team? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a lot left to do, to tell you the truth. And um, uh, it's a credit to our coaching staff, the organization, and the guys on our team. You know what I mean? Like, uh, it's fun to be around our guys. Uh, shout out to my guy, uh, DeAndre Ayton. Congrats to him. Our, our whole team got on a, a FaceTime call last night. But um, it's just a great group to be around. And I think the thing is, is that we understand that we have to communicate with each other. And the biggest thing that we know is, yeah, the first half has been really good. And, you know, myself, Jay Crowder, and a few other guys, after our last game against Golden State, we spoke about how important the second half is. Because when you got a young team and not necessarily been there, the second half is a lot harder. <laughs> you know, games get a lot more intense when guys start jockeying for a playoff position. So we're just going to, Stay the course, keep our head down, and keep doing the work.